Welcome back. If you are joining us for the first time, we welcome you. If you have been attending our other sessions, we truly hope you have been enjoying them. Now we will now resume with our scheduled sessions. Our next presentation is Tracing Our Roots slash Roots, Genealogy, Personal Legacies, and Community Outreach Using Digital Programming, which will be followed by a live Q&A with the presenters. So please enjoy. Everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today. We are members of an organization called the National Museum of Bermuda, as well as associates uh, who assisted us in making this program come to life. Before I begin, I want to start by thanking the sponsors, patrons and members of the National Museum of Bermuda, who enable us to do projects like this and continue our good uh, outreach to our community and in this instance to our international community. We're delighted to be meeting with you today to talk about a program entitled Tracing Our Roots and Routes, Genealogy, Personal Legacies and Community Outreach Using Digital Programming. My name is Lisa Howie and I'll be the moderator for this event and I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement at the National Museum of Bermuda. We'll also be joined by Mandela Sleipborn, representing the Bermuda Archives, Dr. Janet Ferguson, who's our Chair of the National Museum of Bermuda's Education Committee, Louise Tannock, one of our master local educators, Jude Hassel, a local artist, and of course, Dr. Deborah Atwood, the curator of the National Museum of Bermuda. So tracing our roots and routes, how did it start? In 2020, we saw an increased interest in genealogical research, and we were measuring this in, by the number of visits and hits to the museum's website and with over 250 visits in one particular month. Um, and responding to the community's interest in Bermuda's history and genealogy, which actually has been a part of a larger program, we've been delivering a series of lectures also on Atlantic world history and Bermuda's history, all of which can also be found on the website of the National Museum of Bermuda, nmb.bm. So it's connected to a larger education project um, in terms of um, ensuring that current historiography is being addressed at the museum. And then at the same time, responding to this interest that we could see uh, with people looking into their history from behind the scenes at what the National Museum offers online. The goals uh, were always evolving, and I think goals with projects do evolve. Of course, you come up with ideas as we did. This uh, project actually started before COVID. And as a result of the context change, uh, we changed the way in which we delivered the program. It went from a consideration of a short period of time to a consideration across one full year. Our goals, though, were always around making sure that we could meet our community's interest, that we wanted to make new connections with our community as well. It's really important for us to be engaging with the institutions, local and international, um, and we've got members across the world. And so we wanted to find a way that we could connect with them. And interestingly enough, taking the program online enabled us to really, I think, um, transcend barriers related to location that would have otherwise been a challenge. We want the participants not only just to learn about the resources, uh, the availability of the resources, the sources that can be found online or say in the actual Bermuda archives, but we also wanted them to find ways to actually record it, inspire them to get involved with interviews and different strategies beyond just computer-based research. And we wanted them to find strategies also to be thinking about the historical context, unpacking their family stories with an understanding of what was happening at that time period. As I mentioned, in terms of the structure, the event took place across one year. It's still ongoing. We had created online presentations. We had local experts, international experts. The international experts, of course, were a great hook for some people um, who really wanted to hear from them. And they have an interesting following and global intersection. Of course, the local experts brought knowledge that uh, was extremely relevant to everyone here in Bermuda. And, and we also conducted workshops and 
a lot of the resources that we've provided, um, the recordings and the toolkits, all of that is free and available all online. Um, and then in the summer, we opened up an insight, uh, an on-site contemporary art installation, the first of its kind for the National Museum of Bermuda, and we'll speak to that. And the project that is yet to be launched, but is in the process uh, in terms of policy, writing, and organization is a national crowdsourcing project, and we'll speak to that as well. What we don't really know is actually is where the end will be for this program. I think what we've done is we've created something that uh, perhaps has a life force that may be longer than what we can see at the moment. And so the nice thing about where we will conclude uh, with this crowdsourcing project is it will roll over into 2022 and perhaps we'll be seated here again another time to speak to you about where we decided to take it next. But we do hope that in the end that this is a this is a program that will inspire you as well. What's important to us as well, the National Museum and all of you, I'm sure, is to gather feedback from your participants to any of the events and exhibits that you have. And so we did have at the end of, of each event a survey uh, with tailored questions that were helpful for us to think about what we could do better next. Uh, and also to be able to utilize some of the participants feedback in further promotion, marketing and education for the museum. And so those were some of the questions that we uh, that we asked. Um, and I really like the last one. What would you say to someone who missed today's presentation? It's a great way to actually turn around to sort of the uh, the request for an endorsement. Our partners um, for the program have included the Bermuda National Library and Archives. We invited, as I said, local and international experts and academics, the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives, and that was very exciting for us to connect with them. And for the, also with the Center for the Digitization and Preservation of African American History at the National Museum of African American History and Culture at the Smithsonian Institute, as well as uh, an organization that if you aren't aware of, please look at and into is the Story Center. And uh, as I also mentioned, the Bermuda Archives, yeah. So the outline of the public program, we started our marketing for the program in January of this year. And then we launched uh, with a two part series. In February, we started off the journey of family discovery uh, number one with tips and tools and strategies featuring um, Kenyatta Berry, who's based in Los Angeles, and then moved swiftly into the local resources, uh, understanding what we have here on island, um, making sure that people are aware of what's really at their fingertips and often free of charge. And I think that that's part of the genealogical research that does have to be considered is that, of course, that there's, um, you know, there's a monetary barrier to some people getting access to some of the records, uh, facilitating that and managing that may be something for you to consider. I'll just pause. I don't know who's got on, someone's got a, someone needs to mute their, someone needs to mute their um, speaking voice because I could just hear you clear your voice. Okay, I'll just pick that up again. So um, so we, we conclude, we, we de developed a two-part program for uh, for the journey of family discovery tips, tools, and strategies, we started that in February, and and then continued that with local resources, um, and making sure that we're also making people aware that they have access to records and. Uh, resources that are free and available and then others we recognize that there's a monetary barrier and that's something that should be potentially considered and discussed before launching into a program like this. Uh, it'd be a real challenge to see the success of the and our goals reached if every resource um, had a money barrier um, to to getting access. So finding that balance I think is really important. In April, then we shifted gears and had a wonderful conversation with representatives of the National Museum for African American History and Culture. And we looked at and learned from them about their journeys, the people that they interacted with in their communities and the objects that they discovered in order to create and tell the, the exhibition story a narrative that exists at that uh, beautiful museum. In uh, May, we engaged a group of public and private school educators uh, to create a digital storytelling um, activity video. And that was a dovetail with the crafting a personal story, which was delivered by Dr. Janet Ferguson. And those two instances, which we'll unpack, those two projects were really related to moving from and thinking about genealogy as simply being sort of data sheets and records and timelines and family history uh, maps. Uh, and then be thinking about the objects in one home that are loaded with 
uh, nostalgia loaded with information and can actually play a fundamental role in how you're going to deliver the legacy of your family history. How are you going to then shape a narrative to tell that object story so that it can be properly passed on to the next generation or for those in your household who may not even be aware of it. So interesting kind of shift from research to object-based inquiry and, um, and then putting the words and finding the, uh, the way in which to tell the story. We'll, we'll look at a, a great example of that today. And then uh, in July, as I mentioned, we opened up uh, the first ever contemporary art exhibition, Traces and Pastimes, Bird J. J. Hassel, and to be coming next will be the scrapbook, uh, a crowdsourced project. So the journey, as I mentioned, of Family Discovery One Tips, Tools, and Strategies, uh, which was presented by Kenyatta Berry, included marketing outreach of various forms. We had 242 registered participants from around the world and I created a toolkit that uh, many responded very positively to. And again, that lives online. I'd li now like to introduce, please, Mandela's Lightborn. He was one of the presenters um, from the Bermuda Archives, and uh, we've asked him to come and tell a little bit about his story of his experience uh, making that presentation. And you can see in terms of our figures, there was a little bit of a drop, uh, which we can't account for per se, but uh, we were really pleased with nonetheless with the, the number of participants that, uh, that came on board. Mandela's. Yes, Lisa. Uh, good day, everyone. Um, when the Bermuda Archives was asked to participate in the Tracing Our Roots and Roots presentation, I had a general idea of what records would be needed to prepare for the event. Uh, genealogy is relatively popular here on the island and people regularly visit the archives to conduct family research. Not a month will go by without someone saying to me um, they have to come to the archives to look up their family history. Um, most Bermudians will call genealogy research family history. It's more of a colloquial term that we use here. Um, so I felt that, that that was the reason why the Tracing Our Roots and Roots series was, was very important. Um, Genealogy does have its phases of importance on the island. Uh, normally after a holiday or an important family event like marriage or a funeral, we get people interested in their family history um, because questions are often asked about ancestors, extended family or family origins. Uh, so therefore in preparation for the talk, I wanted to present a survey of all the records that would capture the information that researchers would need to make those important uh, genealogical connections. Um, the Bermuda Archives collection has a number of records and series that would have recorded this information spanning a period of over 350 years. Researchers should be able to find something um, if their lineage on the island has been uh, longer than 30 years. Uh, overall, I felt the understanding local resources for genealogy talk was a success it, and it provided a platform for the public to be aware of what records and services are available uh, so that they can conduct their family research. After the event, um, there was a spike in interest from both uh, walk-in patrons and online inquiries from overseas patrons. Um, we were able to assist everyone uh, with their research. Uh, I worked with an awesome team of professionals who are passionate about customer service and uh, have a genuine passion for conducting research. So uh, I thank them. Um, and thank, thank, and we're thankful for the opportunity to, uh, to present for the Tracing Our Roots and Roots series. Thanks, Mandelas. Did you happen to have a particular um, story to share, or was there any kind of research breakthrough that you observed uh, following your presentation? 
uh, one gentleman who actually was he he had asked a question during the the event uh, had was reading about a family member previous to the event in a secondary source. Um, and he wanted to know more information about that particular family member. It was all focused towards a geographic location that he had, he had um, discovered. Um, that secondary source quoted one of our uh, records series, the colonial records. And uh, so we had, he had actual copies of that particular area. Um, and we were able to send him uh, scans of the of the actual original record, um, and with a bit more research, we were able to verify where in England um, that record had pointed to for the geographic location. Uh, it was actually Devonshire, England. Um, so that was that was one of the um, inquiries, overseas inquiries that came up, we were able to assist someone as a result of the event. That's wonderful. You know, there's an obvious um, opportunity here as well with us making this presentation to the Museum Association of the Caribbean is that perhaps, you know, now that there's an understanding perhaps of even that there is a Bermuda archives for, um, you know, this might inspire people to be reaching out to you from other islands uh, for those who are aware of their uh, Bermuda connections. I also do want to thank before we move from the slide, Jane Downing, who is the registrar of the National Museum and Ellen Hollis, who is at the Bermuda National Library, who assisted um, Mandelas in his presentation. Thanks, Mandelas. We're going to move on to the next and, and then swing back to you for questions and answers at the end. All right. You're welcome. So we continued the conversation um, on personal journeys and personal objects and crafting a personal story as we went into the next phase of our presentation of Tracing Our Roots. And um, initially, it uh, was led by Joanne Hippolyte, who is, of course, the president of the Museum Association of the Caribbean and museum curator, Hollis Gentry, who's a genealogical specialist at the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives, Kamala Stinnett and Doretha Williams, Center for the Digitization and Preservation of American History, uh, African American History, also at the NMAAHC. Similar to other outreach, we, we tackled marketing, um, I think the way that everyone probably will do and think about in terms of uh, various interfaces. Um, I do do radio interviews, we, which I know people seem to enjoy. Um, and that seems to be quite a good way of also educating the population in a, in a 15 minute uh, radio spot, if you want to add that um, as well to your list of how you reach out. Um, um, but we are going to transition now to Dr. Janet Ferguson, who presented on crafting a personal story. And, um, and Janet, do you want to take us through your, your presentation and your observations of your presentation? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, greetings. And, and thanks, Lisa, for, for that wonderful overview. And uh, maybe I'd like to just kind of tag, tag into uh, what you've just been describing uh, by saying that uh, the webinar, Crafting a Personal Story, uh, aimed to demonstrate how to put together a short story of no more than three hundred words about a material object. Uh, this could be a book, it could be a jewelry box, it could be a compass, it could be a binocular, it could be a plate, it could be any item that has some meaning for you and, and preferably has some age. It's, it's been around for some time. And, and I think this is a, a, a layer or, or a, a dimension of, of the genealogy work. This is the material dimension of the genealogy work. And so the, the webinar sought to demonstrate how to practice what I would refer to as uh, curatorial, cura sorry, curatorial engagement. So we, we, we kind of generate, encourage a popular curatorial engagement, one that's personal, yet family related, yet community connected. By simply asking, what is this object? What does this object mean to me? What does it mean to my family? 
What does it mean to my community? And what are the ways in which I can make sense of the past and make meaning in the present using this object as a starting point? And so the webinar sought support uh, those who were engaged in assembling stories around those themes. And so the aim was to demonstrate or to provide a cachet of skills that enable us to tell our stories over time and across time using a very simple approach. We basically broke down, deconstructed a single material memory story we showed how it was put together, and then we generated some guidelines that the webinar participants could use. So it was a very simple approach and a generation of practical guidelines. Now, I think the, the second part of uh, a question that I think Lisa posed to me uh, earlier on in preparing for this webinar was, uh, what would one want to see in schools that's connected to this crafting a personal story. And I suppose what one could look forward to is our, our, our material memory projects in schools that strengthen inter and intra-generational communication. Uh, I think of Bermuda, which would be our local terrain. Uh, where are the stories about kite making? Where are the stories about cassava pie? Where are the stories about tools that our grandparents use, items that our grandparents use as part of their daily labor. Using the simple framework that we shared on crafting a personal story, we as a community can write and share these stories. Um, in closing, I'd like to describe, I think one of my most memorable moments. Um, I was interviewing uh, dockyard apprentices. These were men who had left Bermuda in the 1950s to complete their apprenticeship in the United Kingdom. And as one of these apprentices who was then in his 80s welcomed me warmly into his home, he said to me, before we begin to speak, I'm going to get something. And he went into a room and returned. And he opened this wonderful little pouch. And in the pouch were all his instruments, all his dockyard items, the tools that he had used as an apprentice. And he looked at me and he said, here's my story. And of course, we sat, we did the interview, but it all revolved around those items in that pouch and the way in which those items were able to evoke memory was touching, it was profound, and it was beautiful. And so crafting a personal story is basically about using those kinds of items to tell stories that reach across the years and touch us in the present. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Well, thank you. And thank you for sharing that example. Um, Dr. Deborah Atwood and I, of course, were participants with you during that workshop. And, uh, it, and it was very personal and intimate and engaging. And just like you've just said about those tools, it sounds actually a really fabulous moment. I, I, think that, I think that she and I experienced that same kind of aha moment too, while we were in and actively engaged with you during the workshop. So I hope that others will go back to have a look at that recording too. That's terrific. Thank you. And moving on, please, to an extension of where you have just sort of left stuff left us off, Janet, um, is to this digital storytelling workshop that we did with the Story Center. And it's thanks also to Dr. Ferguson for introducing the National Museum of Bermuda to Story Center. And Dr. Ferguson does work closely with them. We wanted to share with you um, uh, a particular story that came out of the experience um, by master educator Louise Tannock. And um, she fully embraced the um, provided by the digital storytelling uh, spokespersons um, who, who guided us through uh, the activity of selection of an object, 
very similar to as Janet was just explaining, selection of an object of importance and um, and then telling that and starting off with say with a photograph and then and telling that important story. Uh, the piece of writing that would accompany it, um, the script, I would describe in terms of literature, it's much more of a narrative poem, I think, in many ways. Uh, you're forced to be very succinct and imagistic. Um, and as a result of the, the time spent crafting the words and the diction, um, there's a wonderful arrival at then thinking through how to shape it visually. And so um, we were a small group of people. It was an intense workshop and I commended the teachers uh, so much because it was such a challenging school year and then we extended the the journey with these educators uh, across the six-week workshop that took them uh, right into the beginning of their summer um, but an enjoyable exercise and we're going to first uh, show you the uh, the video that was created um, and the digital story and then uh, speak with Louise about her experience When I settled in Bermuda more than 40 years ago, my father once came to visit me and his eldest sister who helped provide for me. The prize he carefully unfolded for us was a mango seed he carried on his long journey. I planted it in the backyard. I often sat on the porch with my aunt enjoying a mango and a story. She described walking miles up the mountain in St. Kitts as a young woman to weed the ground and collect baskets of harvested mangoes and ground provisions to sell in the markets. As she grew older, the corns and the bunions on her feet told the stories of her struggles. When a friend whispered she was going to Bermuda, the thought of getting away had never entered her mind. But the more her friend told, the more she began to dream, and fear of the ocean did not dampen her dream. At age 17, in a borrowed dress and a pair of shoes, and $10 in a tucked away purse, she stepped off the deck of the Canadian steamboat that docked in Hamilton. She told me little of how she survived the ocean journey, but she recalled the boxes of fruit that she traveled with and the ripening mangoes that made up most of her food on the journey. Mango trees here do not grow in abundance. The cool, rainy weather of early February, plus the gusty spring winds of March and April, destroy the early blossoms of the mango tree. And if it is planted in an exposed area, it will definitely limit an abundance of fruit. For that reason, a mango tree is a symbol of resilience in Bermuda. My aunt was resilient too. Bermuda in the 1920s had rough edges. Her first job was washing laundry for a kind soldier who lived in the barracks in Prospect across from the cottage where she stayed. Her hands told the story of the twice weekly laundry which became her golden coin to her improved life. She often wondered of her family back home. The stories my aunt shared stay with me and I sometimes share them too. Remember that seed from my father that I planted in the backyard? I waited five years, 10 years, 15 years. Finally, it bore once and gave me three mangoes. This was a prize I did not share.
Thank you, Louise. And thank you for allowing us to share that in this context. I just was thinking of the three fates the <laughs> with your three mangoes. Um, did, you know I have some prepared questions, and one of them is, uh, can you provide three words to summarize your experience with the digital storytelling workshop? Uh, three words, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, or a few more, or a few I more. Would say, I would say nervous. I would say um, exciting. And I'd say a rewarding experience. Just having that story told about family. And it is a story indeed. Absolutely. And I, I mean, I found, I found the journey with you and all of us participating that the outcomes uh, I found quite emotional. And I'm, again, I'm having an emotional response. And I think that just to say something to those who are, who are interested in this project uh, and to work with Story Center is that um, what's very, very interesting about the journey of crafting the story is that it is very emotional. And, uh, and I think that that's part of when we think about how we can maybe take legs and take this into the classroom per se, is a sensitivity to that, that uh, looking closely at an object or a photograph and beginning to tell stories can actually um, open some emotional spaces in our hearts and places or things that we hadn't thought about for some time. <laughs> uh, and I think that we watched that happen during the workshop. Um, so as a teacher, you must be seeing some potentials. I think we talked about that at the end of the workshop. What are your thoughts on that today? Well, as a teacher, I think that it's a wonderful tool to help our children to record their story. But it's a wonderful tool for just preserving history within the family. I think of my own situation because I have taught high school children for many years. And I think that helping them to connect with the older generation is an experience that helps to bring settlement in their life and in their thinking. Um, helps to, to have them feel connected um, in some ways. And I think working with the high school children, it would help them to understand their roots, their connections, and feel that they're creating a, a picture of what their ancestral links are, and that enriches their life. And that intergenerational connection also mentioned by Janet, you know, it isn't something to be overlooked. And perhaps in the context of our, our current moment, um, where many of us are recognizing and appreciating home and family um, and objecthood and senses of security and peace and all these merits to our existence that perhaps have been kind of washing over us uh, for many years and now of course are much more poignantly appreciated and, and I absolutely agree with you I think this this kind of skill that we can continue to share in our community uh, perhaps through classrooms or for, through wider community workshops which is an ultimate phase of this because just to add, I forget to say, actually say this, is that when we did do the presentation from um, Dr. Ferguson, we did ask members of the community if they would like to do a workshop with us um, on storytelling. And I think we can merge that with the skills that you and I learned from the Story Center. So yeah, I think there is a great opportunity. And I think the intergenerational piece um, here, particularly in our cultures where we're so fortunate to have our family lines often stretch quite far. We, not just in terms of the past, but the living present. I know that in the newspaper in Bermuda the other day, we celebrated yet again, another centenarian, centenarian who, a beautiful woman who turned 100 years old. And we have others in our community who, are, who have passed that milestone already. Um, so we had, do have a lot of opportunity. I, I could probably share to Lisa that I had all these photos of family members and uh, it, it, this, this digital storytelling was, was really good for me. I, I thank Mrs. McNair um, from the Story Center um, because it was good for me to just take those pictures that I had and put them in a story form. And some of what um, really happened isn't in the story, but 
what I wanted out of this experience was to link the fact that um, in the 1920s, in particular, a lot of people left St. Kitts and Nevis and traveled to Bermuda for a better life. And um, my aunt would have been one of those people that came in in the 1920s. And we had pictures. And so I wanted to just make that connection and tell that story because she arrived in Bermuda on a boat. It was the 1920s. There was no real commercial business between the Caribbean and Bermuda at that time. She arrived on a boat. And when she arrived, life was difficult. But through her work environment, she was able to make it. And that is so similar to the stories of many Bermudians here with Caribbean connections. Their great grand and their grandparents came here and struggled and worked hard and helped to build the early uh, um, business and life in Bermuda. And um, as a result, they are here today. And many of our young people now are wanting to do that reconnection with their ancestral home. And so I thought that it would be good to just tie in through this experience, that kind of journey and that kind of connection with where we are right now in our lives with what happened before we were born and what will probably take place in the future for us. Absolutely. And that's a lovely turning point as we transition um, to the next panelist. And thank you very much, Louise, um, because you mentioned your family history with St. Kitts and Jerde Hassel also shares uh, family genealogy in, based in St. Kitts. Um, if we can please have Jerde come up onto the screen. Um, traces and pastimes, as you can see, somewhat behind that image of Jerde um, is a large scale installation that is taking place presently at the commissioner's house at the National Museum of Bermuda. And it's situated in terms of the context of the space, it's situated within two exhibits. One is um, slavery is sort of the general sort of narrative, or overarching narrative of enslavement and then more specifically enslavement in Bermuda. And, um, and so what we're going to do is hear from Jerde. She uh, had created a, we created a lovely video that tells her story about her production, and, and then we will come to have Q and a, a Q&A um, with Jordan in a moment. This exhibition for me is about possibility. What is possible for people? Um, when I came and I experienced the Bowling sculpture over two years ago, I walked in the space and was blown away by it. I had no idea in that moment that my work would be alongside his. My name is Jide Hassel and my solo exhibition just installed at the National Museum Bermuda is entitled Traces and Pastimes. It actually started about two years ago when I came across my own family tree. Um, I don't live on island and so sometimes I come back during the summer to visit. And I visited my aunt and came across our family tree. It's interesting because she collects all of our family memorabilia. She cuts off all of the uh, magazine and newspaper clippings. Um, just important documents about our family history. And I'm pretty sure that I may have seen it before, but it's interesting um, what we noticed because I came across this family tree and I was just like, wow, it could be really interesting to do a little bit more research about this and to also incorporate it visually some way, somehow into my artwork. So I created a series of digital collages um, that are layered with archival documentation, with um, personal family photographs, pictures from the Bermuda archives, Bermuda maps. And I wanted to use these images um, and place them within a figure. Um, and so as you're walking down the corridor, you'll be able to see 
some of the images that I've created here on the columns inside the bodies of the people. My work very much so, even my uh, collage work is very much so inspired by my childhood imagining. And so in making this, I was thinking about like how um, I would do certain activities when I was coming up, um, things that sort of like rooted me in my Bermudianness, um, like playing marbles or um, flying kites. Um, and so those moments really stand out for me and I think they do for many Bermudian children. And so I, I really wanted to highlight that because I, I think that's so important for us and our um, heritage and how we identify our culture. And, you know, I wanted the kids to come in here and feel like, oh, wow, like, you know, I'm going into this really old building, but I can relate with this child. One of the things about the pandemic, it sort of allowed for a moment of reflection for people to be able to figure out like what's important. And family was one of the things that I think uh, really grounded so many people during the pandemic, um, being able to myself spend time with family because I had to leave China and for me there was no way that I would have been able to create this work if I wasn't with my family. But what's interesting about the um, installation down the hallways is that um, there's this crisscrossing it sort of like goes up like um, sort of like a roof and I think that that was really cool how um, and that came out. It feels interesting like you're underwater um, so like there's the roof of the water but then there's also like the roof of the house as well so yeah I feel thrilled about how it turned out and um, the shadows um, that are being casted on the figures like really uh, point to this idea of lineage and connections between generations the cover image of the exhibition is actually from my own personal archive. It's my mom and I. We uh, were on a boat. Um, I think it was my godmother's wedding. And the water was behind us. And there was a Bermuda flag like uh, blowing in the background. Um, and for me, that, that picture felt so tender and intimate. Um, even though we were outside, like, I remember that day vividly. And so when I think about um, our lives and the things that we experience, we remember certain things. And I wanted those sort of memories to be placed on the body. Um, and so my mom, <laughs> she's, she's amazing. And so I, I wanted to also honor her because this, family tree that I have is like my, my maternal side um, and so I, I wanted to connect her and root her in this as well. For me this is a really personal moment um, not just in my career but also in my personal life as well. Um, some of the images that are on the wall are, are, are from my own family archive. Um, so I have images of my aunt who has pa now passed away, my nana who now also passed away. And so this is a real personal moment for me. And for me to sort of have this space and have them by way of me in this space, sort of immortalized in this space um, to a degree because the exhibition is going to be up for over a year. Um, it's beyond. <laughs> so terrific! You know, you, there's such a some, such a merit to be put to taking time to do videos like that and make sure that your words and your your that moment as well uh what audiences don't know is that that was filmed immediately after installation <laughs> and that, so your your energy was really high uh, and emotional i thought that you know when you were talking as well um and i was listening again the two things stood out for me was the, where you just ended with a comment on what was so personal you know and i think that what we've what we've really been able to achieve with this program is something that I think all museums want to achieve, which is to really 
make heartfelt connections with uh, with our audiences, with our participants, with our members, um, and to create a memorable experiences that maybe unhinge uh, perceptions or alter attitudes and ideas. And and I know that from everybody that even though I know you were you had to launch virtually but we did do tours after the fact and we continue to have guests of course to the museum and the impact is high um and the and the you know the, the response that people have had is is uh, is is very powerful um I know you felt that and saw that you witnessed that yourself do you want to make a comment a little bit about that yeah absolutely um thank you to everyone for allowing us to come and share our presentations on this amazing program that National Museum Bermuda has for us. Um, it's a privilege for me to have my work installed in this space, um, such a special moment. And it just really underscored for me um, the importance of going back home and ensuring that people um, can have some time with the work. Um, it was incredible. The, time that I spent in the space installing the work with the museum um, volunteers as well. That was an incredible experience. But I think one of the things that really stood out for me um, when we did open the exhibition and when people were coming in during the tours was just the stories that people were telling in front of the work. I think that when people saw some of the figures, they became inspired and thought um, deeply about um, their own childhood and sort of reflected and had moments of nostalgia about things that they were doing, like playing marbles, skipping, um, flying kites. Like these are all huge Bermudian pastimes that I think connect so many of us. And these are activities that we usually do with family members. And so um, having people share their stories and um, come up to me and share how the installation as I'm thinking and reflecting um, was really special to me. A few people also shared um, how they were just inspired to um, look up their own family lineage as well. Um, I felt like in this moment, I was super privileged to be able to have a family tree that's already been researched eight generations uh, back to an Igbo tribe in Africa by way of St. Kitts. Uh, my uncle Derek did all of the research. And so it saved me about eight years of research um, to have and come across this family tree that's already um, crafted. Um, and so I think to use this um, particular moment to reflect on my own family tree and then inspire others to do the research themselves, because um, like a few people were saying here on the panel, many people in Bermuda are interested in their family um, histories. And so um, having an exhibition of this sort of uh, magnitude that uh, reaches so many more people than just my own personal family is, is such an honor. Um, one of the things that was also really impactful for me as well um, was speaking with my... Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. It paused, okay. Um, one of the things that um, was really impactful for me was also speaking with my grandmother, who um, she's not on my maternal side, she's actually my father's mother, but she informed me that uh, Bill Ming, the gentleman who created the sculpture that's also in the space, is actually my cousin. <laughs> so that was really special to be able to have that connection made as well. Um, I think when I had seen his work initially the first time, I was blown away. Um, by his work, but then to be able to have the work in the space next to his and then to find out that he's my cousin on the other side of my family, like how special um, is that? And so finding that there are way more connections than I think we can even imagine is one of the things that's um, incredible about this moment. So that's really interesting because I am um, for those who have who followed the entire program when we, in Kenyatta Berry's opening presentation, she's had a moment where she's self described as having genealogical happy dance, happy feet, <laughs> because during her presentation, she actually used an, uh, um, um, a, a historical reference where it turned out that the person she was referencing had 
living family members in the in the conversation with us who are participating in the event. Yeah, it was very interesting. So I think what I think what you've just described, though, that that the that the research and then the activity and then it leads to the action of more information coming out. And this this is also going back to what Janet, Dr. Ferguson had mentioned too, was there's multiple narratives. We see the multiple narratives visually. Um, you know, you metaphor that beautifully well in your digital collages. And then it's, you know, it is it is very much a reflection of what happens in terms of the actual geological process and what we were trying to achieve as well with the overall program, which is to be able to find, discover, record, and then craft the, the layering of these series of stories that are being told. In the interest of time, Jordi, and I want to thank you so much. We do have to move on, please, um, but we will you. speak with you of the q and I'd like to introduce next, please, Dr. Deborah Atwood. Dr. Deborah Atwood is undertaking uh, something that also hasn't happened before uh, for the National Museum. So if I can please ask her to come up onto the screen and talk us through her upcoming project called Bermuda's, Bermuda's Family Scrapbook. Welcome. Thanks, Lisa, um, and hello to everyone. Um, so yeah, this whole program was kind of came about as obviously this response to this increase in genealogy research that we had. Um, and each of the events, the aim was to provide a little bit more information and to kind of expand your research a bit further. So you started with like, where do you start? Um, and then you got to, okay, well, now that I have this information, how can I craft it in a, in a way that is, makes it easier for me to share it with my family members and other people? Um, and with that, we had a lot of people who were interested in, in crafting these stories. And we were very interested in collecting those stories as ways to make history relevant because you know, we all love historical events and reading about them, but <clears throat> they really don't become um, relevant to us or real until you have that connection with a personal family member. That really kind of hits it home for everyone. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to offer an avenue where people could start to see themselves in the National Museum of Bermuda. Um, and that's where Bermuda's Family Scrapbook came out. So we're scheduling the launch for the end of the year. We've still got some kind of back end online website infrastructure to kind of maintain and manage. But the idea would that be it is that it would be an online national crowdsourcing project. So you could go online, you could fill in your name and all of your information as long as, as well as a uh, short uh, written piece. Um, you could submit a either a, a family a scan of a family photograph or a photo of an object that you have in your your family um, collection, and through that process, you would then be able to submit that. Um, and based on whatever permissions you grant the museum, that story would then either be preserved on our servers um, for research purposes only, um, or the additional permissions would allow us to share your story if you agree um, in an online exhibit as well as within an exhibit in the National Museum of Bermuda. Um, so yeah, so we're really excited to, to see what comes out of it. I think what we've seen from the panelists that have spoken already is that um, just the, I think the two words that keep coming up are stories and connections and the way that people find these connections with their ancestors, craft these stories, and then those stories then create more connections. And that's really what we are excited to see happen with Bermuda's Family Scrapbook. We've already heard mention of, I think, Devonshire in the UK was mentioned, St. Kitts has been mentioned. Um, Kenyatta's example from her event was in the US. And I know we've had members who have participated in the digital storytelling workshop and other events that have had connections throughout Europe, Africa, and the wider Caribbean. Um, so we're really excited to see what connections um, can come out through the stories that people are, um, that the stories that people wanna share with us, as well as what new perspectives on our history um, that we can understand and learn about through these stories. Um, so we are encouraging audiences both here and internationally to explore identity and their connections within the wider Atlantic world history. So including Bermuda, Africa, the Caribbean, US, UK, Canada, and Latin America. So we really wanna kind of get an idea for um, what our shared history is and to celebrate it and inspire 
more people to ask questions and have conversations around it. Absolutely. I am. And again, I again thinking about why we're doing this presentation isn't just to be patting ourselves on the back <laughs> with how we think it went so well, which I which we know it has and it is, uh, but also to inspire. I I think this could be a really interesting, um, you know, cross section of museum activity that could happen if if various museums take up this kind of path and be inspired by our, our program. It'd be really interesting to see how we end up perhaps creating some meta narratives that can be shared across the museums. Um, just to jump in, Deb, thank you. We, you know, in terms of our summary, we're getting to that moment in our presentation to, to wind up. You know, we just to, to make sure everyone's aware of some of the things uh, in terms of the bones of the project, you know, those are the numbers, those are the challenges as all of us can uh, relate, you know, the, the Zoom fatigue is real. Um, and we've all been managing technical issues and hopefully even this presentation has come through okay. Uh, but you know what's really important is to be looking at the number of participants um, and that we did have many, many repeat participants. And I think that was also very important to us as well. We, I think we were developing relationships uh, across the internet. Um, if we go to the next where you know we, we know that we reached a wider audience, but the, by virtue of the fact of being online um, and then having the events recorded, uh, people were able to engage when the time was right for them and they could go back and and slow it down and, and share with others. So there's there's a there's an outreach uh, potential because it's been recorded and uh, and those are potentially figures that we won't even know um, and in terms of how many people will be going online to um, to embrace the recordings. Obviously, working online technologically, it's it has a fairly low cost, certainly has a lower cost than uh, renting an event space. Um, and uh, and it has facilitated new research. Um, there is an In Search of the Robinsons is a blog uh, re recently produced by one of the National Museum of Bermuda's interns, which is available on our website. And as as has been mentioned several times in the presentation, overall uh, new stories, new, new perspectivity, really on our collective history. And so our parting shot is a, a lovely quote from um, the executive director of the National Museum of Bermuda, Lena Strawn, who's also a board member with the Museum Association of the Caribbean. Bermuda's history is far more than a collection of dates, events, and objects. It is also about personal stories and lived experiences. By capturing, documenting, and sharing these stories, our collective past becomes relevant and comes alive for learners of all ages. I want to first start by thanking you all for your attention. Thank you, please, to the Museum Association of the Caribbean for accepting our topic. Thank you to our panelists uh, for taking time today. And we look forward to your questions uh, as we move to the question and answer period. Stay safe, everybody. That was an incredibly informative um, session. Wow, so much information, it's so exciting. Thank you, thank you so much, um, Lisa and all the panelists. So we, like Lisa said, we've moved into our live Q&A session. Please ask lots and lots of questions. You can put it right in the Q&A section at the bottom. Um, and while we're waiting for your questions, I want to open the floor to um, our presenters for any additional comments or um, questions that they have. I'll just jump in um, because I, I wanted just to comment on the emotional quotient of Louise's digital story that I've seen, I don't know, now six or seven times. I'm still t tearing up. I find this whole, I, I <laughs> we, we are the architects of this program and the administrators of it. And now sitting here watching and thinking about this and there's a little there's a chat going on on the side. This is a remarkable program that everyone needs to do. I wanted to open up with a question of, you know, how can we do this? I feel like this should be more like, how can Mac help us all to do these, to do this project? And how do we find a way in order to develop the meta narrative across our islands? This is a fascinating opportunity. And I call calling up the emotional element because that's what we do at museums. You know, we can, we create these memorable meaning making experiences and for me to be experiencing it through a presentation I moderated and a program we've all designed, I'm having a little aha moment myself on how powerful this is. And again, I'm still patting myself on the back. I know, I know. 
<laughs> Janet, did you want to say something? Because I know you are you were chatting, we were both commenting on this in our chat on the side. Yeah, I want to endorse um, what you just said, Lisa, sitting and looking at it, um, you know, almost like an observer, like a silent observer, but at the same time seeing, seeing us, so there's a kind of reflexive engagement there, um, really brings home the importance of this kind of work for communities and the way in which we can reach out uh, to communities, engage communities, and bring museums alive. We're not a place with stale old objects that <laughs> bored people come and look at. Um, of, of, of living history and, and, and it's, 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 it's memory and it's, 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 and it's so we've railed for years about the Christopher Columbus narrative. Okay, that single narrative, we report against it. And it's so good to see a generational step that says, okay, well, what are our stories? How do we tell our stories of how we're present in this space, in the world? And that to me is so exciting. So Lisa, I see we have a question in the chat. Is this an approach that you also being embraced across your museums actively? I don't know. I mean, this is where we can have this conversation. Um, and thank you for the for the question. I don't know what role the um, museum association could take on in terms of this. I know you're already flat out with your programs, but it's um, it really almost begs a, a, a thematic conference, perhaps, right? Uh, that could be on this. I'm not sure. I mean, I can jump in here. Um, yeah, I think um, creating a safe, safe spaces in museums has been something that um, a lot of museums has been have been looking at in terms of um, how do you do it, you know, what's the best method and things like that. And it's not just in terms of dealing with um, challenging or difficult histories that can raise a lot of emotion, but also different types of audiences that come into museums. I'm thinking, you know, audience members that on the spectrum, for example, creating spaces where um, they can move through a museum and feel comfortable and safe. So it is something that I know that museums worldwide are looking into and, and we're trying to figure out ways that we can um, create those spaces for um, as many different audiences as, as we can. Um, and I'm sure that's something that uh, museums in the Caribbean are also looking to. But yeah, that is I, that's certainly a question for I guess um, Mac maybe <laughs> if um, if it's not already being done, um, which I'm sure it is. Something else that I would encourage um, for museums is to be thinking about like the, the with the digital story, we have this technological opportunity that transcends barriers of access, and then with today's installation, you get a different narrative that's being written into the museum as well and that the contemporary art engagement in the context of historical based or archeological based museums, um, as Janet said, like it's, this is how, this is the way in which we can create new places and opportunities of engagement. And, um, and we've seen with Max uh, online virtual exhibition, you know, we, we have this massive talent pool and I'll give a plug to the Atlantic World Art Fair on that regard, because we have this massive contemporary art talent pool that wouldn't it be fascinating for us to see that more of our artists are being featured in, in, um, in our historical museum spaces. Yeah, I just wanted to add to, to that. Um, because, well, hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, for me as a contemporary artist, um, to be in a museum space, a historical museum that doesn't necessarily have um, contemporary art exhibits was just a real honor. And I think it's it's sort of one of those things that's like untapped and presents an opportunity for many other organizations to utilize artists because I think artists have a really interesting way to engage the community and storytell in a visual narrative. Um, 
you know, it's interesting, like going into some museums, like some of the exhibits are, you know, so dated. And I think that if museums did partner with more artists, there could be um, a lot more engagement in terms of like the innovation um, coming up with different kinds of exhibits. And, um, you know, also just giving local artists an opportunity to have national platforms, which can also aid the artist's career. Like this has helped me so much in my career to be able to show my work in such a, a space like this. It's allowed an international platform and an international audience for me. And so, you know, I'm just one person, but I think that there's so many opportunities for other museums to offer um, opportunities like this to other artists as well. So thank you, NMB. And thank you, Lisa. I really appreciate that. Uh, absolutely. absolutely. I absolutely agree with your picture there, there. And I'm looking forward to the poetry in the next installation. You, you, you threatened, so I, I haven't forgotten. <laughs> so looking forward to that strand. But I, I would again add to what's being said by saying there's something delightfully disruptive about this kind of engagement. Um, it moves us away from the way in which we frame museums traditionally. And I think Debbie's touched on that, that people could come into the space and feel safe to tell their stories in their many variations and manifestations. And to me, there's this kind of an onus on the Caribbean Museum Association, on the NMB, to be aware that we can become gatekeepers. So we can become gatekeepers who keep out, or we can be delighted and disruptive and kind of open the door for this kind of expression to happen. It, it, it's a wonderful possibility. I agree, Jenna. Um, one of the questions, uh, I'll take the first question, Deb, you can take the second part of that question. The first part was about the resources. If you go onto nmb.bm and you go to the Tracing Our Roots link, you will see the recordings as well as the toolkits. And those toolkits have uh, resources, Greta, that um, can be downloaded, printed, and, and used to actually gather the data. Um, as well, we have links and all kinds of the places to go to to do further research. Yeah, um, so the second question I think that I'm seeing here is, did you run into any difficulty in people questioning ethics in terms of collecting personal stories? And what did you put in place to overcome these concerns? So um, we were cognizant of that, of the fact that because of the connection, some stories that could come, could come up that people um, may find difficult and maybe not everyone in the family would wanna be shared publicly. So we did include in our toolkit a section on um, being aware of sensitive stories. And that's something certainly that um, our local um, experts at the Bermuda Archives and the Bermuda National Library are cognizant of as well. Um, so when people do come in to do genealogy stuff, I believe that that's something that they cover as well. Um, in terms of sharing the stories, we are looking into um, the ethics of that and we use Story Center, um, which is the group, the US group that we worked with, um, we have a very good kind of template for that. Um, and a lot of it is is being understanding and allowing um, people to make the choice over whether or not they wanna share their story and in what way um, and giving them an opportunity to have their story preserved and then giving them opportunity to have their story shared if that's what they want and acknowledging that if it's not something that they want, then that's perfectly fine as well. Um, and even if it's if it's not something that they want preserved um, in the collection, that's another avenue that um, can be discussed. Um, a lot of it, again, is really making sure that people feel comfortable um, and safe in sharing their stories and researching their stories. So creating that safe environment for people. Thanks, Deb. Um, I was also thinking about, I know we've got a few more moments, I was thinking about Jude's theme, Traces and Pastimes, and um, it's just so interesting how everything seemed to dovetail. Louise's story, you know, we didn't know Louise was going to write her story as she did about, about her family and the, um, you know, the essence of it, this tree, but look how, like, it just how, like, it all just seemed to tie so well in together and connect 
all of us through uh, through the process. So this interconnectivity and the sort of on the unpredictable outcomes um, of interconnection, I think are quite really interesting in this project too. Yeah, and I think also to add on to that point, I think, um, so I don't know if it came across, but both Lisa and I took part in that workshop as well. Um, so if you are going to implement this into your programming, I would definitely say take part in the workshops as well, because I think what both Lisa and I found doing our own respective digital storytelling um, is that some emotions came up um, <laughs> during the process, um, shall we say, and it's, it's a challenging thing. And, and when you experience it for yourself, um, it makes you cognizant of, of the fact that other people will probably be going through or maybe going through a similar um, process and just to just to give them space to do that um, was really important. I think we we all found on that workshop um, in creating our own digital storytelling. Mm -hmm. And that was why also when we're thinking about the potential going into the classroom is that it have to be very structured. You'd have to really make sure you're, you've selected um, whether it's a, a theme or a topic or even an object and you really kind of perhaps keep it more narrow and, and controlled. Um, yeah. Um, just as a, as, a, as a heads up, if you do go down that route. I, you know, Story Center does call out and kind of talk about barriers to, to, to um, opportunities. And, you know, it does have a financial cost. I think it's extremely well worth it. And, uh, and I think that what we've done is by, by being the learners in the workshop ourselves, you know, Deb and I've got a sense of how we could take it forward for the museum, but also recognize too, I think it might need to be continued to be underwritten by a sponsor so that the, the, the experts of, Story Center would actually be the leads uh, at this stage anyway. Um, but that's just as a heads up. I think if just another plug for Story Center is that if you do go down that path with them, you're going to find a wonderful experience awaits you. And I think probably, you know, colleagues for life. Katrina, how are we doing? Okay, so we have three minutes. So if anybody has any um questions or anything else you'd like to add, you have some time to do it. Okay. All right, I guess that's it. Thank you to all of our pa panelists. Thank you, Lisa, Deborah, Gerde, Janet, Louise. Um, it's been an incredible session. I will, I will definitely be going to your website to learn more about this program and to get access to those resources. Um, so exciting. So this is the end of this session. Thank you to everybody who attended. If you have any more questions or if you would like to connect with the speakers, feel free to click on the networking menu on the left-hand side of your screen. And there you can scroll through the list of attendees and presenters and start a conversation. Now, stay tuned for the next live session, the Lunch Plannery, which is We Are What We Eat, a people rooted in resilience, which starts at 12.45 p.m. EDT, so Eastern Time. Remember that to find the next session, you simply need to click on the sessions menu and scroll down the list to find the next session on the schedule. If you have any questions, feel free to click on the chat icon on the lower left side of your screen to ask for help and get guidance about how to navigate our conference platforms from one of our conference ushers. So we'll see you soon. Thank you so much.